OK, you can hear me. Can everybody hear me well? And the back sits? All right. OK, terrific. Uh, so my talk will be focusing on the, some of the practical aspects of what Greg has told you before. Uh, and essentially, he has provided professional theory uh, and some practical model telling how to use CQRS, uh, domain-driven design, event sourcing together to build systems that handle complex business problems and can handle complex technical problems. Uh, and before we proceed with that, uh, if you want to learn more about this, there is a site called securusinfo.com. There is nice, really nice CQRS uh, DDD group on Google Groups. And there are some documents and videos by Greg uh, on the securusinfo.com. So all the information is available there. And actually, if you search uh, long enough, there will be actually torrents for two more videos. So that's at least 20 hours of him talking. And that's obviously not enough time. For, that's too much for a small talk, but we'll try to cover as much as we can from the practical standpoint. Uh, basically, I'm a guy that has encountered these ideas, uh, concepts, a few years ago while struggling to deliver enterprise software, which was called enterprise software back then. Uh, ha and we had to handle problems of complexity, scalability, uh, distributing work between multiple de uh, developers while still staying as a small startup company. And on top of that, we had one additional problem. We had to use cloud. That was political requirement, and we had to use Windows Azure Cloud. And back then, Windows Azure Cloud and the entire cloud computing thing, it was just something completely new, and there was no real experience. And the enterprise patterns, different kind of frameworks out there, they weren't helping to solve the problem. And with these approaches, we abused them badly, but we got the job done, and it worked really nicely. Uh, so why? does cloud computing and actually CQRS is becoming so important these days. It's that these new days we have new technologies and new problems emerging in addition to existing ones, as if the life of developer was boring and sad. Uh, we have mobile stuff. We have mobile smartphones, we have tablets, we have PCs. Uh, essentially, Apple has exploded the market. And I see a lot of guys who have smartphones, and actually smartphone uh, is enough to run mid-size banking company with a low transaction per second amount. Uh, and these new systems, they bring new uh, connectivity modes, they bring new challenges for everybody who wants to develop on them. The second problem, the second challenge that is coming these days is the integration challenge. Uh, probably you have been in tasked sometimes to integrate, for example, with PayPal system or any other payment system, or to build a connector to some SOAP service or provide some inventory management to, replen to track inventory replenishment or whatever. Integration is becoming this really important these days because we have global worldwide economy and companies are working closer together and they're getting more value from the integration. And SecureS as a concept of working with event-centric architectures, uh, as a concept of modeling, designing and developing, delivering this software, it helps nicely to work around and find solutions to the problems of integration. Uh, and another important thing why SecureS and cloud getting more track, are getting more traction these days is the problem of big data. Probably you know that Google was inventing this big table concept. There is MapReduce. There are lots of lots of data that companies store around and sometimes when you're using traditional architectures, you encounter the problem that your database doesn't fit on the memory anymore. Your indexes are too large and you have to buy a bigger server. What if the next server upgrade already costs like ten, twenty thousand dollars and the next one will cost forty thousand dollars? So that's one of the problems that companies are encountering. And as they also encounter processing and handling large amount of data can be extremely beneficial for the company. Uh, especially if the company follows the principles, don't discard any data because it can be extremely valuable someday to do some really smart customer behavior analysis to do some really smart stuff. And again, this is purely business problem, handling big amount of data, handling big stress, uh, finding value in that. But SecureS as a concept, which is useful for the developer to structure his mind, to structure his development, and to be able to solve this kind of problem. And the fourth reason why SecureS is becoming more of a hype these days is that it helps to solve one more problem how to develop for the cloud. Like, we all hear cloud, 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 Windows Azure cloud, Amazon cloud, Rackspace cloud, and there's 
VMware offer, almost everybody is doing cloud. And actually, the fun part, a few months ago, there was a show somewhere around in Paris, in France, and the companies, almost all of them, they had cloud in their marketing materials. And you, if you could ask one of them, why do you have cloud in your marketing materials? What do you use for cloud? Oh, we store documents in Google Docs. Well, yeah, that's technically cloud. Uh, and with the cloud, it differs so much from the traditional data center that we used to have. Uh, in traditional data center, we have database server sitting somewhere close to the application server, uh, sitting somewhere close maybe to web front end, and even desktop users, they are somewhere in the internet. With the cloud, you are forced to live and develop your systems for a really harsh environment. This harsh environment creates new challenges for you guys, and for us, for everybody. Uh, servers can go down. For example, in Windows Azure, uh, the application framework might decide that it's time to deploy new service pack automatically uh, to the Windows worker role, so it goes down. It, of course, it goes up in 10, 15 minutes, but it will be down for some time, and you have to develop for that. The cloud queues, the storage, all these things are less reliable because they're inherently less reliable because they're in the cloud. For example, the cloud queues, they can go have slower response time or they can mess up the order of messages just because they need to rescale. Or the storage, it might be unavailable for some time because the server repartitions. Uh, these are inherent problem of any distributed environment. However, with the cloud systems, uh, the companies, the large service providers, they handle the problems for you. And in return for accepting these problems of volatile cloud, cloud environments, you're actually getting amazing benefits. You can single, have a single man company that develops for the cloud computing platform, whatever you want to use, uh, Azure, Amazon, Rackspace, and your system can have almost infinite scalability, which means that, for example, you have some data processing software, uh, and it usually runs on a single server. However, if you implemented it the right way, then if a huge customer with a billion turnover comes to you and says, okay, we want to process, let's say, uh, 20 warehouses today, and if everything works well, 100, 200, 300 warehouses tomorrow, and we have all the data, we'll be able to process that, uh, classical enterprise applications, which are developed, for example, using transaction script model, uh, CRUD model, batch processing, they won't be able to handle this task without rewriting the system. We know because we've tried to do that. However, if your system is designed inherently to be scalable, decoupled, and easy to work with, uh, then you would be able to say, okay, I'll do that. And over the night, you just spawn a few more worker instances and you crunch the data. When the customer is happy and gives, he gives more data, okay, you crunch more data. Instead of like having two workers or three or several workers, you crunch, you uh, ask for 100 of worker machines. For example, Windows uh, Azure worker instances, they process the data. And as they store more data into the cloud, the Azure cloud or whatever cloud will automatically scale for you, uh, accepting any amount of data you're pushing in. And this is just one specific example which shows that, again, uh, developing for such environment, it requires different mindset, slightly different approaches. However, if you're building with the idea of event-centric architectures, with uh, decoupled bounded context, with event sourcing, with command query separation, with this uh, whole triangle that we'll be talking about with the uh, client side, server side, and read model side, then your software is inherently prepared, or at least more prepared than anybody else, to work in such environments and to survive and actually, as it will work later, to beat the competition. Uh, and one thing that I want you to maybe learn or think about after this talk is that SecureS, which is a hype word, uh, is not a silver bullet. It doesn't fit every scenario. However, if we take this approach and apply it consciously, we can do amazing things. And these things, they uh, can happen because we have a nice mental model that brings together time-proven principles uh, with some of the new technologies that showed up recently, which we can abuse. Uh, and abusing this whole set of things, you can either have small, mediums, medium-sized or large-sized company uh, delivering lots of lots of projects in no time, or you have, can have one-man company or a startup 
that can deliver products that compete with much larger companies just because the startup is so efficient and that it can scale. And not only that it can scale, what's more important, the software, the architecture, the design are so simple that one single man can work with that stuff and stay, stay, still stay sane while adding more and more features. Companies working uh, with the traditional mindsets, with traditional entire architectures, they will have much more problems and waste of resources while trying to chase the market. Okay, and before we proceed, I want to give you one warning coming from my personal experience. Uh, I got into the whole Securus idea as a developer because it was amazing, it was technically interesting, challenging, and uh, I wanted to learn more. And that's what I believe every good developer is doing on a continuous basis. We're always learning. However, with Securus, there was some subtle problem. It allowed to deliver project. It worked, we've learned, then we delivered next project, then we delivered next project. And what happens when you're delivering projects in a company that is really related to the software development or depends on that? It delivered project delivery and their evolution and maintenance. It actually evolves companies to solve their business problems. That's what every software should do. We solve problems for the businesses. <coughs> and what happens to the company which has its problems solved much faster than the competition, which can adapt to the market? It grows. So you have more projects to work on. However, there is a side effect that more projects you get through you, uh, through you uh, you have less and less time to actually do coding, you have to do management, you have to do administration. So beware, if you go to this path, your career might go forward. That's happened to me. Okay, and what we'll be talking about uh, my, our experience in applying these patterns and practices, uh, or abusing them, or failing, and I will focus on three things. First, how this uh, Securus and DDD and event sourcing approaches help to keep projects simple and stay sane. And at the same time, although the project seemed to be simple, decoupled, uh, Microsoft was really amazed by the things we were doing. We got a uh, part Microsoft Partner mm -hmm. Award, the Microsoft Partner Azure Award in 2010. And while interacting with uh, some of the teams who were, were telling, expressing what we were doing, they were saying, okay, it's amazing. How many people do you have, uh, how many dozens of people do you have on your development team for this project? Sorry, on the average in our company, we have 0.7 developer per project. <laughs> it means that developer is, uh, can be leading one project, assisting in another, and doing what, knows, what God knows on his free time. Okay, and the second advantage that this whole brings is ability to manage work to manage developers, to manage how you distribute work and how you abuse the things that you have these days around the world, like the whole globalization thing. Ability to outsource to Armenia, ability to outsource to Russians, ability to outsource to Indians, whatever, it doesn't really matter. And, the th and this actually, although it seems to be a management question, how you organize your work, however, you will find out that, again, if you stay in the Securus or follow this path for long enough, uh, your career will advance and you'll have to address the questions of ma team management as well. And this also has another advantage. Uh, as a developer who is working with these concepts and he knows how to collaborate and he understands how easy it is to collaborate over the uh, unified mental model, uh, you can find yourself, okay, I have good uh, efficient development environment with all the unit testing, continuous integration, uh, distributed version control, uh, and I know how to communicate with designers, I know how to communicate with the domain guys, for example. Okay, why shouldn't can't I take my laptop and go to Bali? You know, Bali is really nice these uh, yeah. days of the year. Well, actually, it's nice uh, almost throughout the year because they have like uh, positive temperature, almost the equator, and local people ha consider it to be bad weather if in the morning the waves were too low for, uh, how is it called, surfing. And again, this is doable, and amazingly enough, I've done this, and it works. You can continue de developing software. You can delivering software, delivering features, meeting milestones, just because the problems of development, the problems of collaboration, the problems of keeping everything simple, which is actually a problem uh, for many companies, it is structured in such a way that it allows you more flexibility, more choices, more opportunities. Okay, and the other thing is that 
Although these concepts uh, and the whole synergy of the development practices, uh, mental model, arch architecture approaches, how you ma uh, map your business realities to the bounded context and the domain model. Uh, although they work really well in medium companies, again, it can work for a one-man company as well. It works efficiently enough that you can deliver projects on your own and be self-sustainable. Okay, and while I'll be walking, uh, I'll be talking, uh, I'll just want to provide you a brief overview of the kind of projects we've delivered uh, with these approaches while learning them at the same time. Uh, the sales cast, it was the, uh, the first project we had to do. It was the first Windows Azure project, and it had huge complexity overhead from the beginning. Uh, as a company, we're providing forecasts, but customers don't care about the forecasts, they care about the problem being solved. So we had to develop a project which actually allows to integrate our forecasting engine with any kind of inventory management a customer can have. And different inventory managements, as it turns out, they have different internal model. Uh, they have different databases. Some of the weirdest databases I've seen, it was a Chinese database, which was, had like 1,000 tables sitting in a small my, uh, MS SQL instance, which was running inside a virtual machine. Uh, the entire thing was so slow that when you tried to just enumerate the tables in a database, it was hanging out. Uh, and we had to integrate with all these kind of databases uh, to retrieve data from them. So essentially integration was a part of our business domain in this project. And at the same time, the whole project, it had to be developed in such a way that it could live on the cloud. That it could, if something goes wrong, if a worker node within the cloud goes do wrong, goes down or is corrupted, the process will still continue. Uh, we had to think in terms of scaling out the entire workflows because retrieving data from a warehouse where they have millions of products and multiples of years of sales history, that can be a bit slow. And again, uh, applying this command query separation uh, and leveraging the advantages which has been proven about, uh, with the messaging for a long, long time were able to achieve that and deliver, and the project was delivered with one man working on that. That's amazing, I think. Uh, the second project, it was a nice experiment. Uh, we started this project when we hired two developers in Ufa, in Russia. And these developers were not exactly the securest type. They worked with SQL databases, with all the classical entire architectures, and the task was, okay, you guys are working remotely, we didn't have office back then, uh, and you need to de deliver this software. The software to provide integration uh, between forecasting engine, and it has email-based interface. That was a funky one. Customer sends an uh, Excel spreadsheet with a time series, and he gets a response with the forecasts in that spreadsheet. And there was a web UI. Uh, and not only we had this funky model, we had the requirement that it should be, this system should be deployed in the cloud, in Azure cloud. And these guys didn't work with Azure cloud before. And also, to make it more exciting, uh, these guys had to work in parallel uh, on the same system while not actually even meeting. Well, I think they met once or twice. And the most exciting part, it worked. We had one guy uh, working on the web UI and on the projections, which were converting events, projecting events to the read models. And the other guy was doing the domain logic, the server-side logic. And they had the project in no time. Actually, uh, one of the guys, as I recall, it, he went ahead. I think it was a server guy. He cranked out the domain module, model, uh, the server-side component, and he switched to something else. And the web UI guy, he was tweaking and playing with the read models according to the marketology requests uh, to make it more nice, more usable, et cetera, et cetera. It worked. And again, these guys, they didn't have any cloud experience before. However, uh, they were aware of the secure architecture by then, and they knew that they have to stick to these principles. And interestingly enough, the mental model you have, you employ, while thinking in terms of infrastructure, simplicity, decoupling, technology, potential technology replacement, uh, when you do about general secure or event-centric architecture, this works amazingly well when you need to build something that works and runs on the cloud. Uh, and the third project, we uh, codenamed Hub. Uh, it was, it still uh, is a kind of personal challenge to me. Because before going in that direction, 
I didn't exactly know how you build complex enterprise systems. You know, like the enterprise system that feeds and powers up the entire company and that gets data from there and there and there and it coordinates sales, marketing, accounting, billing, uh, and it coordinates subscription systems. It was all complex mess in my head and I didn't know how to fit that and also make sure that the damn thing is scalable because we have certain parts that need to scale and that the entire thing is simple so that I can stay sane while developing the system. And it's simple enough so that we can bring a developer to handle a new feature or to add a new feature or to change how the UI looks like. Because actually marketing the department, he likes to change UI a lot. And they're really amazed when you send a request yesterday and on the next day, hey guys, we've deployed a new front end and we rebuilt the views, check it out. And again, the concept of uh, secure event-centric architectures and also the domain-driven design, which is, be became extremely important here, uh, it helps to build and organize the systems <coughs> as in the infrastructure, as in the implementation, and also in your head as a way to formalize business requirements in such a way that they match the reality, the implemented software it works, it runs, and also, you define the bounded context, you define contracts in such a way that when you discover something new about the business reality, that your system doesn't have to change a lot in most of the cases if you've done the domain models right. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, one of the warnings and caveats with uh, this kind of architecture, this kind of development approach, is that when you have a few projects delivered, you'll have more incoming. So we have at least two more incoming. And this are the projects that were delivered to the cloud in a scalable, in, in a potentially scalable way while still learning the methodology, while still getting new developers, while teaching them, and while keeping the development team off free. And we still work and we'll still deliver. So I personally think that's amazing. Uh, and I think that's not only amazing that we've learned that, but it's also that is so easy well, relatively easy, uh, to teach new developers, to introduce new developers, to scale your teams or to help others to solve the technical problems if you just do one thing, if you structure your problem in a such a way that it becomes simpler to solve. Of course, this requires a little bit of unlearning, undoing, but that's the price we have to pay. Okay, so for the third part. One of the most important things that and most valuable things about this kind of decoupled and simplified architecture is that it allows to stick with the common KISS principles. KISS uh, meaning keep it simple, stupid. Uh, some say that KISS means uh, keep it simple and stupid or keep it simple, comma, stupid. It depends on the interpretation. Okay, so what do we found out? That everything, everything, everything when we, it comes to the explaining to the new developers. It revolves around simple architecture, around a simple mental model that you've seen on the Greg's slides, and it's just common sense. Uh, and when uh, we're explaining what we found, when we're explaining this uh, to developers or like to new members of some communities, uh, we explain this in a slightly different way. Uh, we have the client side, the act side, the reporting side. Or Client, command side, right side, which is actually on the read. Oh. Okay, come again. Views, commands, and clients. Client sends commands to the uh, server side. Uh, server side actually contains the business logic, the domain models, which either uh, pers persist this, their state uh, in the SQL databases or like some SQL database storage, or which works much better uh, when they persist their state as a sequence of events, which then get published to the reporting side or all the sagas or other systems, external systems that want to integrate with them. And how we explain this to the developers? Imagine a real world company, the old one, where they didn't have computers, they didn't have types, uh, phones, uh, they didn't have even maybe telegraphs. So we had a manager, like we were thinking about a plant. Uh, and the manager is tasked with a complex task of running his plant. He has some workers, uh, he needs to make decisions, he needs to make sure that the plant that produces, for example, car parts, continues on bringing up profit for the company. 
So he comes to the office and he sees reports. Uh, he can see, he can't actually go to the entire plant and see what's happening in there. Instead, he has reports prepared for, by assistants for them and they're made available for him in the office. When he comes, he sees the reports. Essentially, if we map this uh, to the, this model, the manager, the one who makes the, who decisions based on some information, is the client or the client side. And the, in, these decisions are made based on the reports which are prepared for us in advance. These reports never represent real-time information about the factory plant. Otherwise, if they were made to be uh, representing real-time information, you could imagine the assistants running from the plant to the report, okay, we, have, we produce 59 parts, 60 parts, 61 parts, that wouldn't work. And so the, this manager, he looks at the these reports, which he has by him, and then he makes some decisions. Obviously, he doesn't run to the plant and say, okay, yeah, I want to do this, I want to do that, I want to do this, because it's too time consuming. So he sends orders, instructions, acts to do something. Uh, and these acts can be sent, for example, in terms of paper. Something tangible that has a name in it, that it, has, it explains what you want to do. And this paper goes from his office to the actual factory. And there, the plane workers, they see the paper and they obviously try to accomplish the task at hand, the command that they were given to their best intent. Obviously, it can't always happen. For example, if a manager forgot that the machine was broken or that they didn't have enough resources to, fulfill, to accomplish the task, then the worker will say, oh, sorry, uh, I wasn't able to do that because that something happened. And again, the worker doesn't communicate with the manager directly. He writes notes, uh, he pulls in into his worksheet, he tells uh, the other guys to tell the boss that something happened. And during the day, or closer to the end of the day, we have assistants that are actually gathering around the plant, are uh, rolling around the plant and gathering the information about what happened, uh, which workers showed on the job, what amount of information, uh, materials they were able to consume, how many parts they processed. And these assistants work together to produce reports which will be available for the manager next day. So that's the simple model which is based on the real world, something that could have happened or maybe it never happens uh, in the uh, car factories, I don't know. But it explains how manager sends orders to the worker people who actually do the job who then publish or make everybody aware of the stuff that really happened. And here, actually, assistant can't really say that, oops, uh, so guy John A says that the car, was, uh, the car part was in, wrong, in bad condition or the machine was broken. No, it wasn't broken. Well, the, uh, the worker knows better. So here we have events telling us what happened. These events are composed a report into reports of the use in a way that is convenient for the manager to read them and to make decisions by looking at them and sending orders and acts. And obviously this doesn't happen instantaneously. It happens over the time. Uh, so this simple paper-based model actually matches what we're trying to do with the CRS and information-based models. However, in this case, we don't have the papers, we have commands that still travel around the system and still take some time to, for delivery, and they can be sent, they can be copied, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and while we have, have this model in, uh, in mind, it actually explains, and that's how we have been explaining it to the developers, uh, CQRS, event sourcing, domain-driven design. Uh, you don't have to build in, for example, scalability, because this question, this decision can be deferred, and we can handle it later. How? Oh, it, it, it's easy. We can have multiple managers, or multiple clients. We can have thousands of managers, actually. And they won't have issues uh, by for, to work just because we can have multiple assistants, for example, preparing the same similar reports over the same notifications. And we can have rep reports replicated, like Xeroxed, across multiple offices around the country. Just like we can have read models, which are persisted somewhere in the cloud or somewhere in one database, we can easily replicate them across multiple systems by just multiplexing events. Again, we can have scale this part easily if it's needed because we can just 
partition workers. We can say, okay, uh, team, worker team from A to B, they're handling requests coming from manager A. This team handles the requests coming from another manager. And we can also think that, okay, if there are two managers sending in requests, we maybe need to open another plant. Fortunately, in software world, opening another plant or, for example, asking for another worker machine from the Azure fabric, it is much easier and it requires like from 10, to five sec uh, from 10 seconds to five minutes. Uh, so again, this is a simple, much simpler uh, simplification on both the real world and on the mental model around the SecureS architecture, but it helped to explain how this model works and how it scales. And by actually explaining to the developers that these are some of the things that can be handled by the model as time permits, we were able to ensure that there is le much less upfront optimization. You don't need to optimize, you don't need to scale, you don't need to worry about performance. Because if the business decides that we have to handle the performance, we'll be able to handle it later. And, okay. As I've mentioned earlier, uh, one of the problems, one of the challenges for the company that we had was nobody really knew how to develop for the cloud. Fortunately, with uh, this approach, uh, the SecureS uh, systems built on top of SecureS architectures, they are inherently decoupled and they are composed of small and simple parts. And in each of the separate parts, you can have different design decisions, you can have different technology choices. You, hell, you can use, even use, not only use different frameworks, but you can avoid frameworks altogether. Uh, and these inherent capabilities is what actually makes it much easier and much more fun to develop for the cloud. Okay. So, uh, and just as a story, we have uh, one of the current projects, the Watchtower, uh, which aggregates, again, information from multiple systems in our company. It aggregates from the sales, it aggregates from the subscription management, uh, it gets information from uh, the usage of different systems by the customers. Uh, and it was based on simple SecureS model. Well, it actually was based on my simplified SecureS model because in the first iteration, we didn't really need to have the domain logic or just uh, had this separate system that was simply feeding on the events coming from different systems, 304, and projecting these events into the read models, which are then available for the web UI. And one of the complex problems that when you have a system that integrates with multiple systems, that it's really complex or expensive to do something with that. Uh, for some type of, to get some sort of information from a standalone database uh, which was de developed by a different team, you might need to go to these guys and say, hey guys, can we do this kind of, get this kind of information off your database? And if we do, would it hurt your performance? Because if you're asking questions, of the, the, if you're asking database the questions that it has been optimized for, then you'll have an angry DBA saying, okay, I didn't have index for that, and you're killing the performance shoe of my database. And not only, uh, this also uh, SecureS and event-centric model works around the problem where when you ha want to add additional features, and these features re depend on the certain interactions and behaviors happening in the other system. Uh, and the only way to get this information out of this system is to capture them at the moment they happen. But if the, that system doesn't capture them, then you need to go to these guys and say, okay, please, whenever a customer changes forecast settings or like project settings in, his, in this inner system, please tell us about that. Please save this information into a separate table. I know, I know that you're busy, I know that you have a whole lot of projects, I know that you don't like my boss, but we really need to deliver that feature. And then you can get uh, into all sorts of arguments that their team will, might start lagging on behind because they don't want to implement some messy stuff and have an uh, intercompany argument. However, if the other system is publishing events in a nice way, if they're publishing everything that, happens, that happened in their system, uh, then the integration becomes a boring task. Actually, when I was talking uh, with developers about writing this watchtower system, which 
composes information coming from other systems in a nice way for management, they said, we don't want to do that. Why? It's boring. Okay, guys, if writing a system that integrates multiple systems and presents information in almost like uh, ad hoc way that is easy to be changed per management request is boring, then we're getting into an interesting place in software. If development is boring and simple, then it means that we can deliver more faster with higher quality, giving us time to play with uh, some other cool technologies in between. And, well, since the topic of the talk is uh, practical cloud and secure S, uh, I'll talk about the actual specific technology choices that we're making while developing and delivering software. But please keep in mind that this is just one of the ways to structure and to implement your system around the event-centric architecture. There are many ways. And this one, for example, it mainly focuses around Windows Azure, although there are a few nice, really nice moments that I'll talk about later. So uh, the common pattern we have with Windows Azure is that we have worker process, which is uh, in Windows Azure uh, worker role. We have web front end, which is web role. And we have some data stored in the Azure Persistence. So Azure, as a cloud computing provider, it provides computing resources, which are workers, or you can console them, call them services running, which are, are being run in highly specialized runner. Uh, it provides network capacities. Uh, Azure Data Center is extremely, extremely fast. Uh, and it provides persistence. In this case, the persistence that is provided by Windows Azure, it's uh, some simple, almost document-based storage, which is called table storage. Uh, they provide simplified uh, file storage. They provide also simple queues. And there is some uh, service by bus-like functionality that was covered earlier. And they have also some kind of SQL database there, which is called SQL Azure, but it's not a usual SQL database, is that in terms that it replicates itself and it has much constrained structure. But we weren't actually using that. Uh, and again, this is called environment. So it's really volatile. It can freak some time. Uh, the web role can go down from time to time. Worker role can be recycled, restarted, or upgraded by the app fabric because they take care of managing the system for you. However, you have to accept the fact that the system will have downtimes or like slowdowns when the repartitioning happens. And again, within this same architecture approach, it was relatively easy to handle these problems and not handle them upfront, but delaying, deferring decisions to the point in time where the problem was financially important to be solved. Uh, so for the web UI or clients, uh, we have a whole mixture of actual technologies because it's really easy to implement different clients when you have a fixed structure. Uh, we have ASP.NET MVC, MVC2, MVC3. Uh, we had an experiment when we tried to use a simple HTTP server, which we implemented ourselves as well. Uh, and it doesn't have any server-side tags. What it does, it just serves static files and uh, views in JSON form. Surprisingly well, it worked. And it was really easy to scale. Or we have uh, some APIs which are exposed via REST. Uh, and uh, before we proceed, so basically all these three elements, they communicate between each other uh, via predefined contracts, which are called commands and events. And these have extremely important value when you do domain-driven design. So client side, it's sense commands, which are in the Windows Azure world, just serialized messages, which are posted to Windows Azure queues. And for the serialization, you can use whatever format you want. Again, it doesn't matter. Uh, we prefer to use JSON recently because it just makes debugging story slightly easier. Uh, the server side, it can run anywhere. Uh, obviously, when we're deploying to Windows Azure, we're usually running them in worker roles, which are kind of Azure services. Uh, and what this service does, all it does, is actually accepting commands, processing them, and that's it. And if, in case of the command fails, then we give it a chance to retry the command four times, and that's it. Uh, and because of that, we actually didn't use an service bus, we didn't use any other message broker, we just wrote our own. 
because it was so much fun. And because we wrote our own, then this means that when we're actually developing software, we don't develop this in Windows Azure, Azure environment. Although they have really nice Azure development fabric, which allows you to deploy and debug cloud projects locally, we don't do that because it's too slow. What we're doing instead is the client is still a simple web application, but it's classical .NET web application. It's not a web role for the local deployment. This one is just a simple console process that doesn't require Azure Fabric starting. It actually doesn't even require for the latest projects installing Windows Azure SDK. Okay, that's something interesting. Uh, they say that to develop for Windows Azure, you need to have Windows Azure SDK installed. Well, it requires SQL Express. This requires uh, Internet Information Services 7.5. This requires a whole set of dependencies that are installed. However, since the technology stack is replaceable, it, you can easily re-implement that or have multiple configurations enabled. In this case, when we're developing such a system locally, we just have a configuration or uh, implement, uh, configuration implemented in code that uses file-based adapters for queues, that uses file-based adapters for persistence, or with event sourcing, again, it's much simpler, you don't need any database, that use file adapters for storing views. And because of this nice fact, I was able to do something that I really wanted to do for a long time. I wanted to develop on my own air. Oops. So you can imagine, before that, I had, oh, uh, I hope this doesn't look like <laughs> an Apple advertisement. But my previous machine that I used to do Microsoft and Azure development, uh, it's quad core with 8 gigs of RAM, and it's a really nice machine. But the problem is that its battery lasts for like one hour and a half, and it weighs with the power uh, adapter 5 kilos. <laughs> That's a bit too much. I want to have something much simpler uh, that will look and weigh less and that will allow me to go outside on Bali for long periods of time without the needs to have power supply nearby. You know, it's uh, really hard to get Wi-Fi and power uh, out on Bali beaches. Uh, again, this is a small thing that is made possible just because our technology stack or is implemented in this way and it is implemented this way because the architecture, the design, it allows such an implementation to be possible. And again, this is all replaceable. Technology choices, they don't matter, they can be deferred. Uh, and uh, coming back to the Windows Azure kind of deployments. So on Windows Azure, we have the projections, uh, the processes that accept incoming events, and they project these events to the views, to the persistent read models, which are available for the client to read or query. And in our case, Azure, uh, this kind of functionality, it's again a different worker role, it can be a different worker role, that subscribes to these events, and it processes them, and it saves them as simple <coughs> files in the blob storage within the Azure deployment. And these files are just JSON documents. So we don't need to have any database. We don't need to have any kind of complex setups and more than that, when we're deploying new functionality that, for example, affects only web UI and the read model, this kind of functionality could be uh, the marketing said, okay, we, want to have, we have this nice activity stream that shows what customer had done with it within the account over the last 10 hours. And the marketing comes and says, okay, but when customer sent a re request or when the customer renamed his system, we want this to be visible because it's an extremely important information for the sales or customer support to make a decision. And in order to implement that functionality, we don't even need to touch this side. We just write new kind of projection. Then, since we're storing all events in a separate domain log, which can be a blob file, or it can be a Azure table storage, which is kind of a funky document storage. And when we deploy a new version, we just scrap this, we run all the events through view handlers, and voila, we have the new documents, uh, new read models that match to the new software. And actually, with Windows Azure, what you can do, uh, a really nice thing, uh, no downtime deployments. You can deploy second version of uh, WebRoll in parallel, but it will be invisible for the customer. 
And for this web role, you will be deploying <coughs> new version of the documents, uh, rebuilding them. And when the time is due, you just click the swap button. And what you'll actually do, it will tell Azure Load Balancer to switch request from the first web role to the second one. Okay, so you're delivering functionality that requires relatively complex coding, uh, relatively deep server-side changes without any downtime. In the projects I used to work before, uh, doing something like that required stopping the system, uh, backing up the database, running SQL upgrade scripts, deploying a version, and then afterwards only replacing the screen, which said we're down for upgrade with some new functionality. Uh, and actually, well, coming back to the ideas of portability, again, this concept allows to have the same functionality deployed to different systems. So, what happens is that when you get a system that is easy to develop, that is relatively easy to structure, that is relatively easy to explain, then it leads to the fact that you get first really nice deployment possibilities. Uh, development becomes more fun. Again, as uh, Greg mentioned earlier, when there's something wrong happens, for example, on the server, it will be logged, and you will have the command that went down on the server, and this command will be sent to the customer support immediately, because if command processing failed four times, bam, send me an email. I get an email, I can replicate what happened on the server, because I have the command that contains all the information, I run the system locally. However, while I'm running the system locally, I don't have anything of the Azure complexity. I'm running it either in memory or against file system. It's easy to develop, it's easy to debug, and the problem could be fixed in no downtime. I mean, a uh, problem could be found and fixed in the code really fast. And then, since we have the system that is decoupled, relatively simple, it means that it's more reliable and you're more comfortable with changing it. Uh, you have much better tests, especially when you go with the event sourcing way and you do uh, behavioral testing with specifications. Uh, this means that I can actually fix a problem and they say, okay, I've run the tests, I'm pretty sure that the system will be stable, and surprisingly enough, more, most of the times it is, and I can deploy the system. And again, since the system can be decoupled, the deployment can affect only the part of the system that was uh, implementing the functionality. And after the deployment, I can rerun the command on the server side, and for some long running process can continue. And surprisingly enough, a couple of times, this whole routine of command failing for the customer, me getting notification, fixing the problem, deploying a new version, rerunning the command, it happened fast enough that the customer didn't notice the problem. Of course, this doesn't in, uh, involve like certain cases uh, where your customer expects to see a result within like a, third, uh, a few seconds. But for some longer running workflows which can be implemented in the, this system, they didn't see the problem. So we proactively fixed the problem before customer even noticed that, even reported that. Imagine how much value is that for the sales and for the marketing. And not only like proactive fixing, when customer says something and asks for a request, uh, this can be a deal breaker for, for the sales team. When they say, okay, we can deliver this feature for you within the next two days if, we, uh, if you agree to work with us. And you know what? Since the majority of the competition out there, it takes a few months just to get the first prototype, getting the functionality out of us in a few days, that is something that can break, uh, bring the company a deal and help the business to move forward. Again, this architecture, this design, it allows to structure problems that come from the business in such a way that it's easy to solve them and we can implement them in various, we have multiple opportunities, we have multiple choices, and we can implement them essentially the way we like to implement. And while doing that, solve the problem for the business and keep on solving these problems over and over again, obviously the new ones, uh, without getting dragged down by the complexity. Okay, oh, here's another story. So uh, in this kind of picture, we have the different elements separate. We can either separate this even further by running, for example, separate view handlers in separate servers, with thus allowing us to have much better replication or much better SLAs. 
we can uh, partition the command side or we can load balance the client side. But what other companies were doing, uh, this involved, I think, a few uh, Indian startups that were using the technology. Uh, they said, okay, but cloud computing is so expensive. We want to save on the money. So who cares? In the end, what they ended up doing is that this process and this process is, are actually hosted within a web role. And so basically for the entire de uh, deployment, for the entire web application, everything is within one web role within <coughs> Windows Azure. Uh, if you were, so that's at least saves, uh, cuts down expenses in half. And again, it is possible because the elements are intercomposable and it doesn't really matter where you're running the service bus, uh, what you're using for storage or how you're exchanging the information. This can be changed later. And again, if this company that went this way to save money by pushing, cramming all of the components into a single uh, process, into a single machine or virtual worker role, if this company uh, goes so successful and they need to decide to scale out and to add more performance, or if they need to, they can keep on separating the elements back into the classical position, uh, classical order of three different ones or in whatever other combination of resources they want to use. Uh, and another interesting case was uh, there was, I think, a Russian startup. Uh, they were handling the same problem. There are, uh, I think, two or three guys doing payment system, actually payment plat platform for e-shops. Uh, and they want to use Windows Azure because uh, Azure is familiar. However, for some compliance reasons, they had to use Amazon for hosting certain mission-critical processes which involve uh, dealing with credit cards. So, again, it was easy for them to figure out how to split this, uh, this compliance-dependent functionality into a separate process, into a separate server in the classical terms, and run it in a separate cloud while still having the coherent architecture or still having uh, the mental model and that doesn't drive you insane. What they've done is just, or what they are planning to do, they're just saying, okay, certain commands that will be processing, don't send them to Windows Azure worker, just send them over to Amazon. And when these commands uh, are processed, the events are published and these events are the ones that are allowed, that are routed back to the Azure cloud. And they are handled for the, present, uh, for the projection purposes or for running sagas or whatever in the usual way. Again, just think about it. This messaging-based approach, which uses commands and events for interaction between elements, and the elements are separated, we have distinct roles and uh, replaceable technology in between them, it explains how to create a system that works with multiple clouds. I think that's really amazing, and that's really cool. Okay, let's see what we have afterwards. Oh, that's a fun one. Uh, as I've mentioned earlier, <laughs> separation of elements uh, over an established architecture, it simplifies collaborative development a lot. First, it simplifies the development a lot because this kind of architecture uh, can be applied to various scenarios. So uh, I personally was using the SecureS model even to code desktop client. I know this is not something that usually encouraged, but without this approach, I had so many problems with uh, all these background threads, background pro processes, and async programming. That was a help. However, if you come and think back about this classical architecture, we have a client, we have a command processing and views. It actually became extremely simple to develop a software while still thinking that way. We just have command processing in a few background threads. You have view processing in another background threads. And the only way, uh, place where you're actually synchronizing these background threads with the UI, it's when you query the views. So again, we have classical separation. Uh, it explained me how to write it helped me to understand how to develop a desktop application that is responsive, that can handle large loads without being like freezing down. That was really nice. And again, so uh, what I'm uh, coming here is that this, when you have multiple projects within a company uh, that use somewhat similar architecture and principles, 
then it becomes much easier to communicate within the company over these projects. It means that it's easier to bring new developers in because you don't have to explain the entire like different architecture. Here's how you deploy, uh, develop desktop applications. This is called Smart Client, by the way. And this is, by the way, requires a whole set of frameworks. Or this is how you develop servers. This is, by the way, requires entire architecture and, you know, like ORM tools, uh, different validation application blocks, logging application blocks, authorization application blocks, caching application blocks, all kind of stuff. Actually, you don't need that. First, because you won't be messed up later if you don't handle the caching or in replication or authorization later, because you can always add that as a cross-cutting concern within the messaging solution. And second, because you don't need frameworks. This functionality can be implemented in relatively few lines of code, and it's actually a lot of fun doing that. Uh, and this simplifies for developers to collaborate over various projects, to share the experience, uh, to work and help each other. And also, when you have this established architecture where elements of this system are communicating with each other over established contracts, messages, it becomes really easy to separate the work. Okay, here I have a cool logo. Uh, that's a classical. Again, free, uh, free hexagons, client, which one of them is uh, server side, the other one is projection. Uh, and people start thinking in these terms. They start thinking, okay, we're doing messaging. We're sending commands, we're producing events, and events are something of the past, and they start talking in these terms, not even sometimes thinking that they're doing actual domain-driven design in a subconscious way. And they're uh, projecting these events over to the views, which are then used by the client to make decisions. So it, since the model is simple, it becomes it's easier for the developer to grasp it. However, since the model is decoupled, and these elements are communicating with each other towards the established contracts, which actually change not that frequently within the application lifetime, lifetime uh, it becomes it's easier to assign separate developers to different parts of the system so that they will be able to develop in parallel. More than that, since, they know it's, since it's much easier for them to know and understand other elements, so while doing their work, they can anticipate or help other developers that they want to work with. And this actually helps when you have the distributed teams. When you have, for example, a few developers working in Russia, Ufa, uh, one developer working in Paris, one developer just traveling with occasional connectivity, and surprisingly enough, since they have a bit few less things to worry about, to communicate about, uh, they can work, still be productive, and deliver software with fewer bugs because they don't have this uh, late integration problems, because they don't have uh, to mess up with each, or, uh, each other's internal state or whatever. So it becomes easier to distribute work and to collaborate that. And this actually speeds up the development. It makes it more reliable. Uh, it also makes its life of the manager much simpler because if marketing comes to the development and says, we need this project to be really developed fast. I'm sorry for uh, bothering you, but this became a huge priority because that's a deal breaker. So you can take developers from the other project and bring it to this new project. And even if they were not aware how this project was structured, what technology it uses, they immediately see the common things. Okay, oh, so here we have commands and events and views. Oh, so we're using blob storage for this one. Cool. And for the commands, okay, we've done it differently. We're using JSON, but here you are using Protobuf, and you have a few layers of cross cutting concerns on top of that. But it's all same architecture, and what am I supposed to do? Do the boring projection stuff again? Wow, man. So again, this kind of approach where elements of the system are separate, decoupled, easy to understand, and the technologies within them, technological decisions are deferred and can be redone over and over again, this creates an ecosystem for both the developers where it's easy to learn because they don't need to learn actually a lot of the core, new core principles because they're over and over again. And it helps for the management to jiggle the resources, to get new resources, to move resources uh, from one, one development project to another. And that's actually how Romans, as I recall, uh, founded their empire. They created roads that allowed them uh, to bring troops from one city to another really fast to repel any attacks. 
And here, by implementing this kind of architecture, we're essentially creating a roads that allow management to relocate developers' resources from one project to another, uh, assigning them where it makes the most business value, when it solves the most immediate needs. And while doing that, we have the same technology stack, we have the same tools, we have the same kind of uh, coding style. It becomes much easier, much more fun to develop, and your technological problems like scalability, performance, availability, throughput, they become not uh, something that requires rewriting the entire system, because we didn't account for that. It requires a nice, isolated technological puzzle, which is isolated within one specific piece, within the bottleneck that you need to optimize. Boom. Okay. Uh, another interesting aspect that we get there is that when you start thinking in terms of such <coughs> things, uh, it becomes much easier to do additional stuff. For example, and this might be interesting for the uh, developers who are working in one-man companies, uh, two-man startups, or other lean environments, is that since the elements of the system are decoupled, that they can be easily understood and it's really easy for the, or relatively easy for the developers to collaborate over them, then it makes these elements replaceable. And for example, what this means to me, I can work on a software project, which for example involves web interface. And personally, I'm not that of a web or designer guy. I hate writing them. However, sometimes you need them. So with this approach, I think, okay, so I need this functionality because it's easier if I do it all by myself, but I don't need to worry about the web UI. I don't need to worry about making it usable, nice, or pretty. I can just implement it the way I want. I am capable of delivering the test way, and usually it's really, really ugly. However, if the project, as a proof of concept, prototype alpha version, it proves to be successful, what we can do is uh, we can take this client, actually the entire source of the client, including the message contracts, and maybe either view contracts or events, and pass it, outsource it to some dedicated company which really specializes in the designs and say to them, hey guys, here's the <coughs> element of our system, here's what the commands it said, sends, here's the, here are the behaviors uh, that it might be supposed to invoke on the server. And why, uh, why are you asking about, about the behaviors? Okay, here's the actual server which runs against the file system and in memory. And what we want, we're asking you to do is create a really nice professional looking UI that replicates this client functionality, which I implemented in an ugly way, but does this in a nice way. And you have the specifications, the contracts, you have the behaviors, so you can actually test, uh, you can copy this system and test against it while developing. And by the way, we don't really care which framework you use. You can use Ruby on Rails. You can use Node.js, or you can just use plain uh, static HTML with uh, JSON files. We don't care as long as you're able to provide us with the result, which looks nice, and if needed, you'll be able to maintain and develop. And this kind of decision, at least in my experience, it wasn't possible in the older projects where, for example, your web UI, it has this really complicated SQL query that is com uh, combined, created on the fly, and goes all the way to the database. And the database, by the way, is optimized for this kind of query because it happens too many times. So once again, when we decouple systems, this allows us to make every individual element more simple, more isolated, hence handling the problems that arise within these elements in an isolated way. And we can compose really complex things, complex enterprise systems, uh, almost to the point of digital nervous system that Bill Gates once wrote about. The, the system that integrates all signals coming from all the departments within the company and it allows maybe making some uh, real, almost real-time decisions either in automated way or in semi-automated way. With this kind of architecture, you already know how to do that. You have separate systems that are working, that are publishing events, and then maybe you have a third system that coordinates or provides unified experience by subscribing to all the separate events and aggregating them and presenting them in a nice aggregated way to the marketing. 
Okay, and there was also another way uh, why this approach uh, helps and is more fun. Uh, sometimes in the development, you have certain tasks that you don't have a really good answer for, or you want to, to double check. So what you can do is, for example, we were experimenting with the web UIs, we're, and we're still experimenting with them. And we're not sure which kind of uh, web framework would work for, better for us. Some say it's nice to have uh, to use in the .NET world ASP.NET MVC free, Razor, server-side functionality, and some think that it would be nice to have simple static server. Uh, with web MVC, you have this uh, really nice Visual Studio integration, uh, IntelliSense, strongly typed views. However, it's really cumbersome to upgrade the stuff in the Azure Cloud because you have to deploy a new worker. Uh, with static server, you can implement this uh, non-blocking HTTP server, it's essentially Node.js, uh, in a relatively limited amount of lines. I think Jeremy implemented that once in 100 lines of code using Arax and HTTP listener. Uh, and we had this kind of discussion, which is better. <coughs> However, in this kind of system, we don't actually need to waste a lot of time to discuss. We can actually start two parallel projects. Okay, implement the client using this functionality, implement the client implementing this functionality. And this will not be a huge waste of resources because the, you just need to implement, for example, simple web client that essentially publishes commands and creates the views. And so we not only can only parallelize development, we can also split development into multiple uh, branches and then see which way actually works better. Or we can, for example, uh, oppose two elements. We can say uh, for, to one developer, okay, uh, you are developing this web client, and I want you, okay, no, that's the wrong example. Uh, I'll use yours then. You can use separation of elements within the secure system uh, to outsource elements to different companies. And one of the great examples was that he was outsourcing the projection side. The functionality that actually takes the event stream and projects it into the views which are persisted somewhere. Uh, and what you can do here, you can either split the development between different teams, saying, okay, team A is doing uh, views from A to B, and team B does uh, the other remaining views. Or you can say, the team in Russia will be writing tests to verify that given the events, the views are as expected. And the other team will be writing the actual projections. And then you can uh, basically compare, run the tests against the views and see uh, whether there are any issues. And then you can award the team or award the both, both of the teams if some, uh, one team finds more bugs or the other team produces less bugs. Again, this is kind of resource manipulation. Uh, that you can do on per need basis in your system just because the elements of the system are simple, isolated, decoupled, and you can shuffle them, you can jiggle with them. And more than that, if you're a small startup and you're developing your system uh, within a garage on the work hours or uh, within the evenings or weekends, and you can develop in a simple way, but if the product goes popular, what you can do is you can say, okay, now I need a lot more better scalability, so I want to hire, like go to the, some freelance website and hire a web designer who will rewrite my uh, client using the nice professional web 3.0 looking interface. Then I can ask, for example, some Scala or airline engineer to make wickedly fast uh, server side, just because I need to process transactions that fast and all of the stuff, stuff has happened within one thread or I need to hire somebody else to make sure that the views are stored in the Oracle just because there is some weird compliance issue of the, this really big customer that wants to use my product, but they require that everything is stored in Oracle. All these things are doable. And they're doable because the architecture, again, is separated, is simple, and it allows you to make lots of lots of decisions while incorporating complex behaviors. Okay, and that's essentially what we've been talking about. 
CQRS as a methodology allows to build complex things by making sure that this, the problems that we're trying to solve, structured and solved in a way that is easy to solve them. I know that sounds weird, but again, we're not just trying to solve the problems that we don't want to do. We just want to deliver the software for the company. And cloud computing as a new thing, a uh, new thing, kit on the block, it allows companies, developers, to have much better scalability, availability, or have much more efficient usage of the resources. Like for example, do you know that in Windows Azure, uh, you can have workers allocated for you on an hourly basis, which means that if you have some really huge number crunching to do, you just all are asking for 200 of worker machines, and digital, uh, Windows Azure will provide for them for you for one hour, and then you just release them, and you essentially have the can have the power of our world's top clusters if you're asking for a lot of machines. And this will cost you really a few amount of money. That is something that wasn't possible before. And this power, it allows developers, small companies, to create systems that are really cost effective, uh, that are flexible, that essentially can compete in the terms of the amount of resources used with huge customers. With huge, uh, I mean, not with huge customers with huge companies, with huge competition, over large customers or small customers. And by using CQRS approach to, and with domain-driven design and event sourcing to capture the essence of the problem around the company, to implement and model, to model and implement in, in such a way that solving complex business problems becomes much simpler. As, and it becomes much simpler, not only because you have explicit behaviors captured, the explicit intent that you don't lose any data, but also since you don't have to worry about the technological issues, you don't have to optimize for the performance, you don't need to solve the problems upfront that you might never even need to solve. Uh, and this combination of methodologies, technologies, way of thinking, it really allows developers and companies to deliver amazing things and this worked for us, and so it works. And we're trying to share this experience and like to help others just because by sharing we're learning. So uh, that's why one of the things that we're doing that. Uh, and I understand that uh, this topic is a really huge one. Obviously it requires a lot of learning, a lot of time. I've, I think at least invested three years on that, but it was worth the experience. So if you're interested in this topic, just uh, go Google, go to the securestinfo.com, uh, go to the, uh, read the documents that are published there, uh, watch the videos, go to Amazon and subscribe for the future book that will be published soon, not mine, by somebody else who's sitting in the audience. Uh, and don't hesitate to collaborate, uh, to participate in the community, to ask questions or to help others uh, understand better. Uh, by doing that, basically we'll be helping everybody else to make the software development slightly more fun, slightly more interesting, uh, the place where you can really deliver complex things with small teams on time, while uh, sitting, for example, on a building with a Russian friend and drinking vodka. Okay, having that said, I hope you take out something out from this uh, small presentation, and if you have any questions, please be welcome. Sure. Well, we'll think of something. Okay. Or if I think we still have a little bit more time, so if you want, I can walk over some of the like. How many? Please raise your hands. Those who have heard about CRS before coming to this conference. Okay, uh, keep your hands up. And how many have actually tried uh, playing with these uh, systems? And who actually delivered software using these this, uh, ideas, these approaches? Okay, that's not many uh, hands that are staying up. And now please raise your hands, those who really like the ideas and would love to be able to use them in the next projects, if, uh, for example, your boss allows that, doing that, 
and if you can do that. Okay, who is interested? And who is also interested in, or even thinking about starting a startup someday that will use this awesome business idea that you found working on a company? <laughs> Or maybe just starting a startup like on your free uh, weekend hours by uh, just working on that, this uh, really quick prototype and then sending the web designs to Romanian companies. I think actually they have really, some uh, really nice web designers. And sending the server-side functionality to Russians because we're, they're really good in algorithmics. And sending uh, view models uh, like the boring stuff to Indian uh, developers because they're relatively cheap. <laughs> So again, this is possible, this is doable, and with this you'll be able to actually produce some really nice results by using this weird combination of uh, people from all over the world to produce a uniform software without maybe even having to, uh, without the need to collaborate on that software, and you'll be able to deploy the thing in a cloud. Essentially, uh, this means that you don't need a huge data center upfront, you don't need to pay for a monthly payment for two servers. What you can actually do is you can uh, deploy the software in the cloud, for example, on one virtual machine, and then if suddenly uh, you, hit, uh, you get slash dotted and your small project that you rolled on a, over the weekend becomes popular, okay, who cares, you just scale out the read site, okay, the website is under load, you scale out the website, and you add some more uh, processing power, and it just works, and you keep them growing, and by the way, the cache keeps on incoming. And if this, this project didn't work out, again, since you're in the cloud, you don't really care about uh, the fact that you've paid for the server or a huge server like for a month upfront. You just turn down the machine and you get paid only for the few hours that you've been using it. This kind of flexibility, this kind of unique opportunities that are available to the developers these days because of the combination of cloud computing and availability of the knowledge which explains in a structured way how to build systems which are distributed, decoupled, and it happens to fit nicely uh, the cloud computing principles. That's what makes it exciting, really exciting for the development these days. Uh, and also, while uh, developing or reading about the project, uh, I mean about the concepts, you might encounter things like hidden potency, message ordering issues, transaction boundaries, or replication, scaling out, uh, like immediate replication or replication to data centers around the world with a delay of 10 milliseconds. These are the issues which are usually considered at the first stage of huge enterprise systems, huge enterprise projects that are considered upfront. Because if you, dis if you don't build in replication upfront, then you'll get stuck either with uh, SQL-based replication which is kind of messy because it requires adding separate columns and transaction log shipping maybe or some other mess. And essentially, if in the usual way, you don't build all this kind of technological choices uh, in your system up front, you'll be messed up later. However, with this kind of approach, decoupled systems, extremely simple systems, uh, <coughs> not even using frameworks or components if you don't need that, you can defer these questions, these problems to the point where you will actually need them to be solved because they will bring some amount of money in your pocket. However, while you're working on the business idea, while you're working on the core concept of something that will give your product or your company uh, a competitive advantage, you can focus on these essential bits and use something stupid as file system or maybe even in-memory queues to prototype, file system to persist uh, the views, and simple HTTP endpoint to pass commands from the web client to the server, surprisingly enough, it will work. It will allow you to capture the intent, to prove the concept, uh, to make sure that the idea works. And if this works, it means then, <coughs> then you'll be able to scale out, to implement the proper technologies, to switch the stacks, to get off the shelf components if needed, etc., etc. Again, you get more flexibility, you get more options, and you get simpler tasks which can be solved one task at a time. Hopefully, this increases the amount of success and amount of enjoyment that you'll be getting out of the development. This cannot be implemented in every environment, of course. We're considering that there could be uh, huge enterprises, huge companies that have really strict political reasons, really hard compliance requirements, so you can't just barge in and say, okay, I want to use uh, event sourcing, 
uh, or I want to use CQRS, or I just want to use the main-driven design, and etc., etc. You will meet all sorts of resistance. However, again, within this body of knowledge, it is possible uh, to look even at big, complicated systems, uh, which are maybe a mess of code that was produced by generations of developers, but this mess of code, it happens to be making money for the company. Uh, and if you proceed to, uh, through this learning path, it will be easier to see uh, how to break down these complex big systems, uh, to break the systems uh, into smaller elements, and then handle problems inherent to some of the elements in a way that it just, for example, increases, improves performance, improves throughput, gets rid of the deadlocks, uh, reduces server latency, etc., etc. And hopefully this will, yeah. Just a, just a short question. You mentioned that it's possible to outsource uh, some stuff. Yes. Uh, for example, to India. Yes. Uh, can you explain why uh, it should be possible these times? It should be possible, sorry? Yeah. Why sh should it be possible to outsource uh, some work? with this style of architecture instead of, uh, where's the difference to the classical? Why should it work this time? Uh, because with this uh, style of architecture, you're not you don't need to provide a lot of specifications, you don't need to write a really complex technical document to say, okay, you're developing this kind of component that interacts with this database, which has these tables, and it has to meet these certain SLAs, and by the way, when it returns data, it has to be this, you don't have to spend time documenting and making sure that you're documenting not only the functionality of the component that has to be delivered, but also inherent uh, specifications of other components that you will be interacting with, just because it's all so tightly related. That would actually we've been uh, experiencing before on my, one of my old projects when we were outsourcing uh, things to first to Romania and to India. Uh, it ended up horribly. Not because uh, these guys are bad, but because we had such a complex architecture that when we were saying, asking them to, could you please optimize performance of this uh, really nice uh, document grid, uh, we weren't first able to explicitly, easily explain how to optimize. Uh, we weren't able to say, okay, so you don't touch our database, you just write your uh, own database, populating it of the event stream and optimize it as you want and we weren't able to keep the functionality that they implemented separately. This led to such huge mess that after these changes were added to the code base, it doubled. So we had like 100,000 lines of code, and after this performance optimization, it was 200,000 lines of code. Uh, needless to say that this project didn't go on well. However, let's imagine we have a different system where we have separations between commands, events, views, and what we're asking to optimize one element of this system. So if we're asking, task, uh, passing a task to the outsourcing company, saying, okay, please uh, write us the projections that will transform this stream of events into these views, and we don't even need actually just explicitly specify to think about events and views because they are already specified in contracts. They can solve problems independently in a completely isolated way with a minimum things that they need to be distracted with. This immensely helps to specify what has to be done and this increase the probability that the job will be done within the budget, within the time and within the requested quality. So but again, by having a system that is isolated, that is logically decoupled into small and <coughs> simple elements, it's make it easier to develop these elements, to evolve them, or to pass the work of development or evolution to different developers within the company or to companies outside your entity. I hope this answers the question. Okay, anything else? Okay, then we shall conclude that. Uh, if you have any questions, I encourage you uh, to check securesinfo.com. There are links to the Securest DDD community, which is really helpful and enthusiastic, and they really answer the questions. Uh, and at securesinfo.com, there are links to my blog, to Greg's blog, and all the kind of publications that have been published by lots of people around the world. 
So I hope you enjoyed that talk and thank you for listening. It was a pleasure.